some sort of a package or a gift, a card even maybe for Christmas in July. So that's a family tradition that we have. We'll get to July 25th and we'll call each other and we'll exchange Merry Christmases to each other. I can remember one spe uh, spectacular time. Uh, I was in um, I was in New Mexico camping at a high uh, high altitude camp, and my mother sent a package to me, and it was homemade cookies. <laughs> I loved them, my friends loved them, the bears loved them. <laughs> the bears didn't get them. We know how to put the food away. But, you know, that was definitely uh, a high memory here. But Christmas in July is in our What's Happening. We're collecting again, continuously, so that we can get care packages together. All right, last piece here before we get going uh, with our testimony today. Everyone needs a friend that they probably shouldn't be allowed to sit next to at a serious function. <laughs> yeah, I am looking at you, Kenny. Because I know you and I would get in trouble if we sat next to each other. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, so I'd like to welcome back again Susan Sparks. Nice to see you again here. We do have your apple here today, Miss Susan. What that means is I lick it and we put it on the tree. No, I don't like that. We put it up on the tree. <laughs> that would be gross. Now, I, I talked to our next visitors um, who are visitors. Yeah. <laughs> that ain't it. That ain't it. Uh, testimony speakers. And Don said he could do this in under five minutes, but I'm going to give him eight. Don and Linda Farley. Yay! Yay! Hey, <laughs> Linda, all right. Okay, you get my three minute one today. Okay. 1968, young serviceman, Mannheim, Germany, headed down the bars. God stopped me in my tracks. And as a result of that encounter with my Lord, I got saved in the Mannheim, Mannheim Fellowship Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Church in Mannheim, Germany. God gave me a wonderful wife as an answer to prayer. He gave me two wonderful daughters, one's in Gainesville, one's in Georgia. And God has blessed me and with a wonderful wife for 43 years. Went to Bible College, Seminary, Puerto Rico, West Germany, East Germany, Guam, Claremont, Florida, Gainesville, all there as missionaries, church planting, and ministering to people. Seeing people get saved because that's what it's all about. Amen. We're not saved to sit. We're saved to serve Amen. until you get so old you can't get up anymore. <laughs> anyway, and uh, so we did all that together, and the Lord saw fit to take my wonderful wife, uh, 43 years, home in, the, in 2013 as we were building their last building, uh, church building in Gainesville, Florida. And so the Lord helped me. He gave me strength. I didn't live a perfect life by any means. It was a struggle. It's hard when you lose um, more than half of your life. But in 2017, enter... <laughs> Prayed. He said, Lord, send me someone different. <laughs> well, we had no idea what he got. I am totally different. Anyway, I'm in Palm Coast, and I'm very happily single for 20 plus years. I had a date here. I was busy running that. I also taught a uh, women's Bible study at the jail in Flagler County for four years. And I was very happy with everything. But there was a little nagging voice that said, you need to get married. And I kept saying, not listening. No way am I getting married. I'm very happy with everything. I didn't want to give everything up that I was doing. So the jail got closed down because of a major renovation. <coughs> and we were not essentials. We were not, you know, we were in the way for security reasons. 
and so it was shut down you know for a while so my daughter-in-law said hey this is a great time why don't you go on eHarmony <laughs> so I went on eHarmony very unsuccessful did not like it was trying to get off that day and a little click came through like a little smiley face and I said, well, let me just see what that is. It was him. <laughs> he had a fisherman's hat on and he had a fish. He's... <laughs> and I thought, he looks pretty harmless, so I think I'll check into that. And so I clicked on, it was February the 8th. We immediately hit it off. He didn't tell me he was a pastor. But after I divulged lots of secrets, he proceeded to tell me, you can tell me anything you want, I'm a pastor. And I went, panicked. I thought, oh, what, what I told this man? I went, you know, thinking, because I was very transparent on that. So anyway, we met, we decided to meet. He was living in Williston and I was in Palm Coast, so we decided to meet in St. Augustine for the day. It was our first date. On the first date, we had a fabulous day. He proposed to me. Oh. <laughs> At five o'clock, the church bells were ringing right after I said, I do. And as I'm saying, I do, I do, I said, who is this speaking? Because I knew it wouldn't be, wouldn't be me. I had no intention of ever getting married. So we met. We met after that several weekends. We would rotate back and forth. And April the 29th, Am I right? Yes, something like that. April yeah. <laughs> the 29th, we got married in the church that he had started and was preaching in and retired in. And that was uh, six years ago. Aww. So that's our story. She spent about three weeks just trying to decide what to wear that first good day. that day. <laughs> Get acquainted times. You never even know what's going to have gone, uh, gone on in these people's lives. And we have somebody every week that's going to take five minutes, just like they did, take five minutes and introduce themselves. Uh, and next week it's uh, Charlie and Diane Nevels that's going to introduce themselves. So don't miss that. They have they have a colorful background. <laughs> Well, it's so good to see all of you here. Some of you have not been well and you're back. Uh, it's nice to see Lucio and Muriel. They are friends and co-workers with uh, Sharon Rao. And Sharon Rao has them up visiting occasionally to our class. And they're here today for a special occasion. The special occasion is Sharon's birthday today. for being here. Now today we're back in Jeremiah. <clears throat> the title of our lesson today is Shapes. Now I've, I've thought about all different kinds of ways I could introduce the lesson by shapes. Like I could say, what shape are you in? <laughs> when you look in the mirror, when you first get up in the morning, what kind of a shape do you see? Well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> that that uh, bothers me, okay? But when I... When I think of shapes, I think of things that you, you'll get a picture. You'll get a picture immediately when I say these different kinds of shapes. A square. A rectangle. A circle. An oval. A triangle. A hexagon. An octagon. A pentagon. A parallelogram. Do you know what that is? Okay. Uh, then there are other shapes that have different meanings. There's the shape of a heart. There's the shape of a cross. There's the shape of an arrow. There's the shape of a cylinder. There's the shape of a star. There's the shape of a crescent. Now every one of those conjures up in your mind a picture automatically and immediately. Well, we're going to talk about shapes uh, this morning. 
Now, here's the overall statement of our lesson today, and that is that God is in control shaping his people for his purposes. God is at control shaping his people for his purposes. Now, last week, we listened into a prayer that Jeremiah prayed to God. And he started off by saying, How long, O Lord, will it be before my enemies are punished? We talked, we talked about the imprecatory prayer, where you pray for punishment for somebody. Now, God had promised that he was going to bring judgment on the nation of Israel because they abandoned him and worshipped idols. And so we listen to Jeremiah praying to God, how long is it going to be before you do this? Now, we can make this statement very confidently. Everybody faces God's judgment. That's not my word. That's God's word. Everybody faces God's judgment, specifically death and hell. We all face that because we have all sinned. We have all missed the mark. We have all not been perfect in our life. And that's, just, that's God's word. That's not my word. However, if people repent of their sin and they place their faith in Jesus, he will give them new life. And when they get a new life, it's the difference between um, perish forever in hell and eternal life in heaven that's what john 3 16 says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, perish but have everlasting. everlasting life so the difference between perishing in hell for all eternity and living with god in heaven for all eternity is what you do with jesus and so and Jeremiah had delivered this message to the children of Israel. So now today's lesson is about the fact that God has the freedom to change his plans. Aren't you glad? Have you ever changed your plans? God has the freedom to change his plans. He reserves the right. He's God. He has the reserves the right to change his plans about based on what humans do. You remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? God told Abraham he's going to destroy the city because of his wickedness. And Abraham said, what if you can find 50 people? I'll save it then. What if you can find 40? God changed again. I'll save it for 40. What if there are 30 righteous people? God said, I change again. What about 20? He changed again. What about 10? He changed again. God reserves the right to change his plans. And when he says he's going to do something, it only happens based on the response of the human race, how we respond to God. So now the Lord had told Jeremiah, what he wanted to say to the people to warn them of the judgment if they don't change. Today, God wants to give Jeremiah another message. But he's going to use an unusual way to do it. He's going to use an object lesson. Isn't it neat how object lessons can bring a truth home? Do you remember the message last Sunday from the preacher? Do you remember the object lesson about what happens when two people try to... The, uh, do something together you remember when he tied the two people's legs together the two guys and he said okay now both of you walk together and they stumbled and, see that's an object lesson that painted a picture so today God is going to give Jeremiah and we're going to get to see it too this object lesson okay and so what he wanted Jeremiah to do was to watch a potter at work Brings us to the first point, remade. Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 1, here's where it starts. God says, or Jeremiah says, this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. 
Now, though that phrase is used often in Jeremiah. He makes it clear that everything, that, that God's word comes to him and he only speaks what God tells him to speak. And so he only spoke what came from the Lord. This wasn't his own idea. So Jeremiah is going to get a message, a word from the Lord by seeing something as well as by hearing something. You know, we remember way more of what we see than what we hear. Would you agree to that? Yes. Okay, so uh, school teachers will tell you that. Uh, so when God says, I want to show you something, and then I'm going to reveal my word to you, he's got a really good message to give. And so, verse 2, here's what God said to Jeremiah. Go down at once to the potter's house, and there... I will reveal my words to you. Now, when he said go down, I try to figure out where. I mean, he must be up if he's going to go down, right? <laughs> Unless you're like, uh, you're up north and you say go down to Florida. Well, you don't really go down. It's on the map. It's down, you know? So, but anyways, the potter's house was located right next to the potter's field. And the potter's field was down close to the Valley of Hinnom, the Hinnom Valley. The Hinnom Valley was down at the bottom of the mountain. At, you had to go down and from Jerusalem, down to the south side and from Jerusalem, down to the Hinnom Valley. So he did actually have to go down to the potter's house. Now, the Hinnom Valley, the Hinnom Valley was a place, uh, it was not a very nice place. It was a disgusting place. It actually became the city dump. It was where the animals that were offered for sacrifice, where their remains were thrown down there. It's where uh, the worship to Molech was established, where they offered children in the arms of this brass model of Molech, and they were burned alive. And those children were thrown into the Hinnom Valley. It was a nasty place down there. But this was down, the potter's field was right next to the Hinnom Valley. And so, <clears throat> the potter's field was an area that had very rich red clay. And so the potter would go down to that potter's field and he would dig holes in the ground and he would pull up lumps of clay and that's what he would take to work with over a period of time the the whole area was pocked with holes like big nasty potholes they didn't he didn't fill them in he just dug more clay and then of course in the potter's business one when, when he fires the pottery sometimes they would crack when they would crack, it would be no good. So they would take the, he would take the cracked pottery. There's only one thing you could do with it. You can't redo it. He would smash it. When he smashed it, he'd scoop up the pieces and he would take it down to the potter's field and he would fill up the holes down there. Can you get the picture? All right, now this made this whole area of land very unusable. Okay, you couldn't plant anything, you couldn't grow anything, and so the potter's field became like a desolate, useless piece of land. Where else have I heard about the potter's field? Well, do you remember when Judas betrayed Jesus, Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? When he realized what he did, and he came back, wished that he hadn't. He threw the 30 pieces of silver that he got from the temple priests he threw them back at the temple priest and went out and hanged himself the temple priests looked at 30 pieces of silver and said what are we going to do with this they said to each other that's blood money we can't take that back so i know what we'll do why don't we buy the potter's field and that way we'll have a place to bury judas <clears throat> They bought the potter's field to bury Judas. And that became then the place where criminals and poor people and indigent people who had no 
way to be buried otherwise, that's where those people were buried. They didn't have anywhere to go. You could be buried in the potter's field. You know, I got to thinking, I wonder if we have any of those around today. I looked it up. Guess what? In Tallahassee, three miles from here, there's a cemetery, and it's called Sunland Pauper's Cemetery. It's also called Sunland Jail Cemetery. It's a cemetery where prisoners, when they die, they have no family, they can be buried there. It's a place where poor people, paupers, can be buried. You don't have to buy a lot. You just get to be buried there. That's the potter's field. That's where the potter's house was. And Jeremiah goes down to the potter's house to get a message from God. You see, God spoke using common scenes to communicate the message that he wanted Jeremiah to preach. Guess what? Preachers and teachers and even Jesus used illustrations in his messages to the people to get a point across. Isn't it nice when you hear an illustration, you say, wow, that clicks. I understand that. That's the way God was teaching Jeremiah. Verse 3, Jeremiah says, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working away at the wheel. Now, the potter is God. We're, we're making an analogy here. The potter is God, and the clay is people. So there he was, the potter, working away on the wheel. Now, that's the first line on your paper. Let's go in. The potter is always at work with the clay. The potter is always at work with the clay. Now, we can make analogies all through this this morning. Like, for instance, God is at work putting on you. He's always at work on you. He hasn't let, he doesn't stop. He doesn't take the night off. He doesn't go on vacation. God is working on you. He's working on me. It says, there he was at work, working away at the wheel. The wheel, the literally, the word wheel means two stones. And so there he was working away at two stones. And the picture is very simply this. There was one big round stone that was on the bottom. There was a smaller stone at the top, and it was connected by a wooden post in between. And this was the original potter's wheel. The potter would sit down and he would turn with his feet the big wheel on the bottom and then that would rotate the wheel on the top. And that's what he worked with on the clay. Now over the years, obviously things have gotten a lot better. Do you remember the sewing machine when they had a treble? Yeah. Yeah. Treble sewing machine, you could work your feet and it made the sewing machine go. Well, the potter's wheel uh, ended up having a treadle where they could, the wheel was turned by the guy pedaling. Then ultimately they came up with electric motors and now you can get potter's wheel. You just flip a switch, boom, and it goes whatever speed you want it to go. Slow, medium, fast, whatever. So that's how the potter's wheel. There he was. He was uh, working on the wheel. Verse 4, it says, but the jar or the vessel that he was making from the clay became flawed in the potter's hand. So he made it into another jar or vessel as it seemed right for him to do. Now, we don't know how long Jeremiah watched the potter at work. I don't think he went down there, took one look, and then left. I think he might have stayed all day long. You know it's very interesting to watch a potter make something out of a clump of clay. If you want to, go to YouTube. Just type in potter and clay. You get a whole bunch of YouTubes and you watch people making pottery. You'll have preachers preaching messages about the potter and the clay. And we watched some the other night and we went for hours. It's just very, very interesting. Well, Jeremiah watched this because he's going to get a message. So the jar that he was making, something happened to it. Um... Let me say this. First of all, the, the potter is the one that chose the clay. It didn't jump up there all by itself. Okay? The potter chose the clay. 
That means he chooses you, okay? Um, the, and um, the potter chooses what he wants to make out of the clay. It's not what you want to be. God has a plan for your life. And so the potter chooses you, and then he chooses what he wants to make out of you. And so uh, the clay doesn't have any input. Clay doesn't say, wait a minute, I don't think I want to. First of all, you're going to have to tell me what you're going to make out of me before I'm going to let you touch me. No, he doesn't. the clay can't do that. The clay just lays there. <laughs> but God chose people down through history. He chose Abraham because he wanted to make out of Abraham a nation of people for himself. He chose Moses, because he wanted somebody that they could make and mold to pull them to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. He chose Joseph because he wanted to make and mold somebody who could, who could um, save the children of Israel during a time of famine. He chose David because he wanted a king, somebody who was after his own heart. He chose Mary and molded her wife to deliver Jesus into this world. He chose Peter. What for? to be one of the pillars of the church, the new early church. So God chooses people, and he knows what he wants to make out of those people. And that thrills me to think about that. Now, it says that this thing became flawed in his hand. In other words, while he's working with the clay, something happened to make it go wrong. Well, there's a couple things that could happen. In, in the clay, there might be... Um, some foreign matter like little tiny stones or maybe little pieces of leaves or something like that could be in it and as he tries to make something that ruins the the, the pot it, you, you can't make it with that foreign matter in there he's got to get it out and redo it maybe the maybe the clay had lumps in it and it wouldn't it couldn't make the pot because uh, there would be a lump of clay and you have to beat it and smash it and get it all down to the same consistency Maybe it was too dry or too wet. You watch these people make pots and stuff on YouTube. If they don't get the right amount of moisture on their hands when they're making this, the pot won't materialize. It'll break apart while, they're, while it's spinning around. If it's too, too dry or too wet, sometimes there are air bubbles in the clay. Air bubbles. Uh, maybe they could, it couldn't take the pressure. And it came apart. So something that happened while Jeremiah was watching, this thing came apart and disintegrated in his hand. So um, it says, so he made another jar as it seemed right to him. So if necessary, the potter will take the clay and make it into another vessel that he has in mind. John 15, 16 said, Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. I get a picture of uh, when you were in school when they went out you went out to recess and they were going to divide up into teams. The, you're the captain, you're the captain. Each captain gets to choose somebody, right? So Jesus is the captain of one team. And Jesus chooses you to be on his team. You didn't choose to be on his team. He chose you to be on his team. But you accepted the invitation. He chose you to be on his team and you said yes. I'll join your team. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship. Once we get on his team, he begins to work with us. He wants us to be good players on the team. He chose us to work with us and make a vessel out of us. We cooperate with him. So God works according to his plans and purposes, but he reserves the right to change his actions based on a change of circumstances. He might have chose to make a pot, a, a picture, and then the circumstances changed, and now he makes a, a bowl, a cereal bowl out of it. Or maybe he makes a, a big flower. Whatever it is, he changes based on circumstances. So well, the one thing I want you to remember here is that the potter does not give up. He continues to work with the clay, and that's the next line on your paper. Fill it in. The potter never gives up on a lump of clay. Aren't you glad he doesn't give up on you? I'm glad he doesn't give up on me. I'd have been gone a long time ago. God's still working on me. Which brings us to the next point, which is sovereign. So God told Jeremiah, this is the illustration. God told Jeremiah, 
that he was in control of what happens to his people. His righteous character demanded that his response to the people would be based on their response to him. God's response to his people was based on their response to him. So, you're going to see how that works here in just a minute. Verse 5, the word of the Lord came to me. See, Jeremiah needed to understand exactly what God wanted him to say to the people. He's making the application here. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and it's, and it said, verse 6, House of Israel, can I not treat you as this potter treats the clay? This is the Lord's declaration. Just like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, house of Israel. So Israel was the clay, and they were dependent on the Lord regarding their future and their existence. See, God had the right to determine what to do with the clay. He could make anything he wanted using whatever amount of pressure he needed. You, you do more, more pressure on the inside and outside, and the pot gets bigger from the inside. The more pressure, the bigger it gets. But the more pressure also, the thinner it gets, and the finer it gets, and the more beautiful it gets, the more pressure. So God had the right to determine what to do, and he could make anything he wanted using maximum pressure. Sometimes you might be asking the question, what's he doing with me? I mean, I, don't, I can't understand why God is doing this in my life. Well, I don't know what he's doing in your life, but I would just simply say, let him do his work and cooperate with him, and he'll, you'll turn into a beautiful vessel, you know, accomplishing what he wants you to do. So here's the next line. God alone determines what he wants to make from our clay. God alone determines what he wants to make from our clay. Remember that. Verse 7, God says to Jeremiah, At one moment I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will uproot, tear down, or destroy it. So God says, I might just say I'm going to destroy a nation. Now, God is over every nation. Do you believe that? He is. He's, the, he, he's over everything in this world. He was over Edom. Edom sinned wickedly. God destroyed Edom. Uh, he was over Assyria. Assyria, wicked uh, uh, idol worshipers. God saw the sin and he destroyed them. Sodom, Gomorrah, God destroyed them. Babylon. God destroyed them. The judgment on these nations was based on the sin of the people. How about China? How about Russia? How about Iran? How about the United States of America? God will judge a nation based on the sin of its people. The worse it gets. Um, Linda was telling me this morning, she just heard that these climate change people, they want to do what they want to do now to keep the, the climate from getting so warm. They're figuring out a way to block the sun from shining. I'm telling you what, the, God, God must look down and say, whoa, what are you going to tell you the You're going to block the sun? God will judge a nation based on, based on the sin of the people. So when, when a nation deserves God's judgment, he might just uproot, tear down, and destroy it. Like a farmer who's abandoning the land because it's so covered over with weeds. And uh, that's what happened with Noah. God abandoned the whole world. Destroyed everybody. Save Noah's wife and the three sons and their wife. Eight people in a boat, boat load of critters. And God saved them but destroyed the whole world because of the sin and the wickedness of the people. So he says, at one moment, I might announce I'm going to destroy a nation. Then he says in verse 9, however, if that nation, about which I have made that announcement, turn, turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the disaster I had planned to do to it. So get a picture. Here's a dad. He's at work. Mom calls up and says, hey, honey, our son is being a terror at home. He's beating up on the sister. 
He's throwing things out. He won't clean up his room. He's making a mess. He's disrespecting me. And Dad gets on the phone with the son and says, when I get home, I'm going to whip you beyond you. Learn. Never, I'm going to give you a whipping like you've never had before. <laughs> he comes home. While the rest of the day went on, the son got to thinking. You know, I shouldn't have lived that way. I'm going to make up with my sister. I'm going to tell my mom I'm sorry. I'm going to mow the grass. I'm going to paint up my room. Dad comes home and he sees the son as a different person than what he just talked to him a couple hours ago. Do you think that dad is going to beat the snot out of his son? No, he changed. He now, he is not going to punish his son like he said he was going to do. That's what God does. If I tell you I'm going to punish you and you change, I have the right to change my mind. I don't have to do what I said I was going to do. Isn't that great that we have a God like that? And so, and so, um, God is righteous. You know what that means? That means he always does the right thing. I wish I could say that I was righteous. Meaning I always do the right thing. I would like to be that way, wouldn't you? Yeah, sure, we'd like to be righteous. We'd like to, like God, we like to do the right thing all the time. However, God laid out a, he laid out a, uh, a series of conditions by which he might choose to change his mind on how he would act. God never changes his will, but he can change his actions. God says, I will punish sin. He never changed that. But when he says, I'll punish sin by doing this, if people repent of their sin, he may not do that. He has the right not to do that. So if a nation turns it says if the nation turns from its evil ways and turns back to God now that's outward actions you can tell when somebody turns from evil that's not a decision in their head that's actions that you can see okay and so I'm thinking of this verse in 2 Chronicles 7 it says that my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land Amen. that's exactly what he's talking about Amen. if the nation that I pronounce judgment on if they turn from their wicked ways Amen. I may just relent from the punishment I promised to give them. now God says if they turn he would relent relent means to be sorry or to grieve so God can be sorry and grieve now those are inward emotions that's not something you can't tell if somebody's sorry you can't tell if they're grieving that's inside God can grieve and say um, I'm gonna change my actions so the outward actions of the people change the heart of God and God then changes his actions the previous plans he had no longer fit the situation now god is not wishy-washy um he's not indecisive he has unlimited knowledge and sovereignty and he combines with that grace and mercy and to respond graciously when people repent you remember jonah jonah preached to a city called nineveh it was the capital the gigantic capital city of Assyria. It took three days to get through the city, just walking. Jonah preached to him for 40 days, that in 40 days, God's going to destroy this city. 40 days, God's going to destroy this city. God, 40 days, God's going to destroy this city. God said he was going to destroy the city in 40 days. What happened? It was the biggest revival recorded in all of history. Hundreds of thousands of people fell on their knees and came to God, including the king. From the king down to the bottom, everybody gave their heart to Christ. Amen. Did he destroy the city? No. no, he changed his mind, changed his actions. And that is exactly what Amen. the message that God is trying to get through to Jeremiah. The people will change, I'll change. Verse 9, at another time. God says, I might announce concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant it. So God might announce that he's going to 
build and plant a nation. And if so, that's his plan. He wants to bring blessings of that nation. And that's the prophet's message. But then he says, however, verse 10, if that nation that I, that I want to build, if that nation does what's evil in my sight, by not listening to me, I will relent concerning the good I had said I would do to it. So in other words, if he promises punishment and they change, he'll remove the punishment. If he promises blessing and they, they sin, well, he has to change the blessing. He's not going to bless them like he said he would. Here's five truths about uh, the character and the ways of God. Uh, if you want to write it down, you can. I didn't have that place to put it there. Number one, people have a choice. God says, you got a choice. Many of God's promises are conditional. You have a choice, and if you choose, here's what the conditions are. Started way back in the Garden of Eden. He said to Eve, you eat of the fruit of that tree, you're going to die. She had the choice. She ate. Adam ate. They died. Spiritually. Second, God reserves the right to change his actions based on our responses. He's God. He can change based on our responses. Number three, an announcement of coming judgment is an act of God's grace. And God says... I'm going to judge you. He's showing grace to you. He's giving you a chance to repent. When the father said to the son, I'm going to whip you within an inch of your life when I get home, that was grace on the part of the father. Because when, he, when the son knew what the father was going to do, that motivated him to change and get his heart right. Number four, God respects the choices people make. God, God doesn't, he, he, you can choose whatever you want and he respects your choice. If you choose to turn away from him, he respects that. If you want to turn away from God, you can. You just suffer the consequences of turning away, that's all. And number five, God is willing to extend his grace to anyone he chooses. Amen. God is willing to extend his grace. There's nobody outside the realm of his willingness to extend grace. So God warned the people of Judah and Jerusalem to prepare for his judgments, and now he tells Jeremiah what to say to the people. So here's what God said to, to Jeremiah. Now here's what I want you to go tell the people. Verse 11. So now, say to the men of Judah and to the residents of Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I'm about to bring harm to you and make plans against you. Turn now, each from your evil way, and correct your ways and deeds. Turn now. It's personal. He said, go to the men of Judah and the residents. It's personal. People were responsible for how they responded to the word of the Lord. It's still the same today. It's personal. You can't respond for somebody else, but you are required to respond yourself to what God has to say. And he says, I'm about to bring harm to you. That's an announcement of judgment, of upcoming disaster. It's actually, he actually says, I'm forming an evil against you. That's Potter's language. I'm forming an evil uh, against you. And I'm making plans against you. Or planning <coughs> plans against you. The Hebrew phraseology is used to strengthen the idea of the verb. I'm not just planning. I'm planning some plans for you. Okay? And what are those plans? The specific plans was going to be this uh, Babylonian invasion that God was preparing for the children of Israel that would destroy Jerusalem, the temple, and send most of the people into exile in Babylon. God says, I'm preparing. I'm planning to do something to you. Now, correct your ways. Turn, each of you. Each person must turn themselves. You can't repent and be saved for somebody else. You have to repent by yourself, for yourself. That's your next line. Every single person must repent individually. Every single person must repent individually. Then he says, correct your ways and deeds. Now that's a plural. Not only individually, but the whole nation. You've got to correct your ways, all of you. You've got to correct your ways and deeds, independently and corporately. Then he says, um, and correct your ways. Now this is called repentance. 
Repentance is a positive response to God's word that brings a positive re consequence. If you repent, God rethinks what he's going to do to you. He will not punish you if you, if you repent and you come to him. So verse 12, God tells Jeremiah what the people are going to say. <laughs> he tells them what to say, then he tells them how they're going to respond. Verse 12, but they will say, it's hopeless. We continue to follow our plans, and each of us will continue to act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. So they say it's hopeless. There's two possibilities what this might mean. First of all, it could mean that they would like to change, but they were too stuck in their ways to repent. They were too entrenched in their plans to change course now. They felt that the clay of their hearts was hardened to the point that it was no longer moldable. It's hopeless. We want to change, but we can't. That might be what they were thinking, but it's more likely the second thing. Uh, this would be a deliberate rejection to God's, of God's call to repentance. In other words, they're going to say, God may have plans for us, but we reject his plans and we'll continue to follow our own plans. Our hearts may be evil, but we choose to follow our hearts anyway. This is what Jeremiah heard all throughout his ministry. People rejected God. And this is what is... Um, so the people of Judah had staked their claim against God and his ways and would resist him to the end. If you resist God to the end, you will receive God's judgment. It's very simple. That's why we do church. That's why we teach the Bible. That's why we present the gospel. Because we want people to repent and turn and come to God so that their future will be settled in heaven and not in hell. Psalm 2.9 says, You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. That's the judgment for a person who refuses to accept Christ, rejecting Christ. So the last line on your paper says, Willful defiance shows the stubbornness of an evil heart. Willful defiance shows the stubbornness of an evil heart. See, they would rather pursue their own desires and face God's judgment than repent and find God's mercy. That's where these people were. If they believed that God was going to judge them at all. I read a little story I thought was interesting. Herbert Hubert von Herkimer was a great Bavarian sculptor. His father was a sculptor before him, though not as great as the son. His father... In his declining years, he was well up into his 80s, he came to live at the son's home. Every evening, in a way to pass the time, the old man loved to work with some clay. But all the years that he had worked had caused his fingers to become weak and stiff and his eyes to grow dim. So he would work in the evening and then when he would finish before he'd go to bed, he would step back and he'd look at what he'd been making and he would always be plunged into disappointment and discouragement, he would say, I guess I'm just not capable of good work anymore. And then he'd go off to bed. While his dad was sleeping, the great sculptor himself, Hubert von Herkimer, would go to his father's work and rework it very carefully so that the next morning when the old man got up, came down. He would look at what he had done the night before, but he's looking at it now with fresh eyesight and bright, uh, bright light of the day. And he would always say something like this, you know, maybe it wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> now that's what God does for us. No matter how many times we turn away from him, no matter how many times we fail in our commitment to him, if we return to him, if we sincerely Ask him to go to work in our lives. He'll do it. And we'll be surprised to discover that when he, what he creates in us, what he fashions of us, and what he makes of you and me, isn't so bad after all. All we have to do is recognize that God is the potter. Recognize that you are the clay. Recognize that he's always at work in your life recognize that he knows what his plans are for you recognize that he will work out the defects 
if you stay on the wheel. There's a song I bet you know. The chorus goes like this. Have I known way, Lord? Have I known way? Thou art the water, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, here and still. Let's pray. <laughs> Father, please be free to work in our lives make us to be what you want us to be and may we remain pliable in the potter's hand in jesus name amen, amen. thank you for being here today come back and see us again it's so wonderful to see you